So I'll start with this. A couple years ago, an event planner called me because I was going to do a speaking event. And she called and she said, I'm really struggling with how to write about you on the little flyer. And I thought, well, what's the struggle? And she said, well, I saw you speak, and I, 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 I'm going to call you a researcher, I think, but I'm afraid if I call you a researcher, no one will come because they'll think you're boring and irrelevant. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And she said, so, but the thing I liked about your talk is, you know, you're a storyteller, so I think what I'll do is just call you a storyteller. And, of course, the academic, insecure part of me was like, you're going to call me a what? And she said, I'm going to call you a storyteller. And I was like, oh, why not magic pixie? Um, I was like, I, I don't, I, I, let me think about this for a second. And so I tried to call deep on my courage. And I thought, you know, I am a storyteller. I'm a qualitative researcher. I collect stories. That's what I do. And maybe stories are just data with a soul, you know, and maybe I'm just a storyteller. So I said, you know what? Why don't you just say I'm a researcher storyteller? And she went, <laughs> There's no such thing. <laughs> so I'm a researcher or storyteller. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today. We're talking about expanding perception. And so I want to talk to you and tell some stories about a piece of my research that fundamentally expanded my perception um, and really actually changed the way that I live and love and work and parent. Um, and this is where my story starts. When I was a young researcher, doctoral student, my first year, I had a research professor who said to us, here's the thing. If you cannot measure it, it does not exist. And I thought he was just sweet talking to me. I was like, really? And he's like, absolutely. So you have to understand that I have a bachelor's in social work, a master's in social work, and I was getting my PhD in social work. So my entire academic career was surrounded by people who kind of believed in the life's messy, love it, you know, and I'm more the life's messy, clean it up, <laughs> organize it, and put it into a bento box. Um, and so to think that I had found my way, to found a career that takes me, you know, really one of the big sayings in, in social work is lean into the discomfort of the work. And I'm like, you know, knock discomfort upside the head and move it over and get all A's. That's my, that was my mantra. So I was very excited about this. And so I thought, you know what? This is the career for me. Because I am interested in some messy topics, but I want to be able to make them not messy. I want to understand them. I want to hack into these things that I know are important and lay the code out for everyone to see. So where I started was with connection. Because by the time you're a social worker for 10 years, what you realize is that connection is why we're here. It's what gives purpose and meaning to our lives. This is, this is what it's all about. It doesn't matter whether you talk to people who work in social justice and mental health and abuse and neglect. What we know is that connection, the ability to feel connected, is neurobiologically, that's how we're wired. It's why we're here. So I thought, you know what? I'm going to start with connection. Well, you know that, that situation where you get an evaluation from your boss and she tells you 37 things that you do really awesome and one thing that you can't, you know, an opportunity for growth. <laughs> um, and all you can think about is that opportunity for growth, right? Well, apparently this is the way my work went as well because when you ask people about love, they tell you about heartbreak. When you ask people about belonging, they'll tell you their most excruciating experiences of being excluded. And when you ask people about connection, the stories they told me were about disconnection. So very quickly, really about six weeks into this research, I ran into this unnamed thing that absolutely unraveled connection in a way that I didn't understand or had never seen. And so I pulled back out of the research and thought, I need to figure out what this is. And it turned out to be shame. And shame is really easily understood as the fear of disconnection. Is there something about me that if other people know it or see it, that I won't be worthy of connection. The things I can tell you about it, it's universal. We all have it. The only people who don't experience shame have no capacity for human empathy or connection. No one wants to talk about it, and the less you talk about it, the more you have it. What underpinned this shame, this I'm not good enough, 
which we all know that feeling. I'm not blank enough. I'm not thin enough, rich enough, beautiful enough, smart enough, promoted enough. Um, the thing that underpinned this was excruciating vulnerability. This idea of in order for connection to happen, we have to allow ourselves to be seen, really seen. And you know how I feel about vulnerability. I hate vulnerability. And so I thought, this is my chance to beat it back with my measuring stick. I'm going in. I'm going to figure this stuff out. I'm going to spend a year. I'm going to totally deconstruct shame. I'm going to understand how vulnerability works. And I'm going to outsmart it. So I was ready. And I was really excited. As you know, it's not going to turn out well. Um, <laughs> you know this. So I could tell you a lot about shame, but I'd have to borrow everyone else's time. But here's what I can tell you that it boils down to. And this may be one of the most important things that I've ever learned in the decade of doing this research. My one year has turned into six years, thousands of stories, hundreds of long interviews, focus groups. At one point, people were sending me journal pages and sending me their stories, um, thousands of pieces of data. Um, in six years, and I kind of got a handle on it. I kind of understood this is what shame is, this is how it works. I wrote a book, I published a theory, but something was not okay. Um, and what it was is that if I roughly took the people I interviewed and divided them into people who really have a sense of worthiness, that's what this comes down to, a sense of worthiness, they have a strong sense of love and belonging. And folks who struggle for it, and folks who are always wondering if they're good enough. There was only one variable that separated the people who have a strong sense of love and belonging and the people who really struggle for it, and that was the people who have a strong sense of love and belonging believe they're worthy of love and belonging. That's it. They believe they're worthy. And to me, the hard part of the one thing that keeps us out of connection is our fear that we're not worthy of connection was something that personally and professionally I felt like I needed to understand better. So what I did is I took all of the interviews where I saw worthiness, where I saw people living that way, and just looked at those. What do these people have in common? And I have, I have a slight office supply addiction, but it's another talk. Um, so I had a manila notebook, a manila folder, and I had a Sharpie. And I was like, what am I going to call this research? And the first words that came to my mind were wholehearted. These are kind of wholehearted people living from this deep sense of worthiness. So I wrote at the top of the manila folder. And I started looking at the data. In fact, I did it first in, this very four, in a four-day very intensive data analysis where I went back, pulled these interviews, pulled the stories, pulled the incidents. What's the, what's the theme? What's the pattern? My husband left town with the kids um, <laughs> because I always go into this kind of Jackson Pollock crazy thing where I'm just like <laughs> writing and, and going and kind of just in my researcher mode. And so here's what I found. What they had in common was a sense of courage. And I want to separate courage and bravery for you for a minute. Courage, the original definition of courage, when it first came into the English language, it's from the Latin word cur, meaning heart. And the original definition was to tell the story of who you are with your whole heart. And so these folks had, very simply, the courage to be imperfect. 